94.9 Bermuda. Hour and hour and hour and hour 95. And it's time now for a motion to adjourn with MP Chris Famous and Dwayne Robinson. And welcome to Motion to Adjourn. I'm your host, Dwayne Robinson, and then today I'm here with Don. Hey, man, how you doing? <laughs> yes, I'm good, I'm good. Good, good. Fortunately, my co-host could not be here today. Yes. Um, so we'll be pushing ahead with the topic mm-hmm. at hand. And we know a lot of parents uh, are very pensive about returning to school with this new Delta variant uh, and numbers and cases rising. So we thought it would be great to have uh, the Minister of Education, the Honorable the Allah Rabban one, uh, to to speak to those safety protocols and to kind of alleviate some of the stresses that many parents may be feeling about sending their children back to school in the new year. So without further ado, I believe we have our guest on the line. Uh, how are you today, Minister? Uh, good afternoon, Duane. Good afternoon, uh, Don. And good afternoon to the listening public. Um, it's always a pleasure to be able to um, reach out to the public and actually have those types of conversations that we are talking about today, something as important as um, the things that we have in, we have put in place to um, try and keep our schools safe and, more importantly, open for our children so they can, um, so they can participate in the learning that they deserve. Well, thank you for giving us um, a bit of your time. We appreciate it. Um, just to kind of kick in so that we can get the information out there, uh, just want to kind of hand the mic over to you to mm-hmm. kind of go over a few of the, if there are any changes to protocols dealing with Delta. And, you know, if if people don't know about what protocols are currently in place, if you could give an outline of what's in place and if anything has changed due to Delta in the new okay. year. Okay, Dwayne. Um, first, first, and, first and foremost, I just want the listening public to know that we follow the advice of the Department of Health. And the Department of Health are the ones that give us the guidelines to follow, and we pass them on. Because I've seen people, people will contact me and say, Minister, do this, Minister, do that. But I want people to understand that, you know, it's not, um, it's not something that uh, we take very lightly, and, and we take our advice from the Department of Health, and the Department of Health are the ones that compile um, the, regu- the rules and regulations that we are to follow in order to um, prevent our schools from um, being closed. And so with that, I want to, uh, and I really do want to stress, is one thing that we added at the end of last year, um, Duane, was the saliva screening prom process, and it was a pilot at the end of the last school year and it is something that we well, we intend to implement again this upcoming school year. And how and how that um, saliva pilot program works is students are students um, submit to saliva testing on a regular basis. There are three types of um, some testing. Uh, there's the saliva where the students make a deposit into a tube um, while being watched. There is also the option for students to do it themselves, and that's more of the older students. And then there are some of our students who aren't able to produce the saliva, and so a swab on the inside of the cheek is um, administered. And what the purpose of this is, is to be proactive and potentially catch any students who may be asymptomatic and not know that they have been, they have um, had a potential exposure to COVID, so we can catch that early and prevent anything, any um, outbreaks from happening within the school. So we can essentially keep the schools schools open. In, mo- in some cases, the Department of Health might be able to say, we've caught this, so the, the class bubble doesn't have to quarantine, and, and therefore the school, you know, and, and casual contacts don't have to do this and that sort of thing. And so the reason why I bring that up, uh, Duane, is we cannot test any student whose parent has not consented for the child to be tested. Um, and this is where we find a lot of resistance uh, from our parents, uh, particularly at, in the public school. At the private schools, um, they are reporting, you know, a high 90% um, um, consent being being given for their children to be tested because obviously they they want to be they want to use every tool at their fingertips to in order to keep the schools open. Uh, however, us at the pro, at the public school currently, where we stand at around 30%. 
of parents who have filed the consent forms. And what we're doing is we're pleading for parents to help us keep your children safe, help us keep our schools safe, and more importantly, help us keep our schools open. If parents had given consent last year during the pilot, they are still required to give consent this year. So I've talked to a few parents and they've said, you know, um, well, we gave consent last year. What do we have to do? Why do we have to do it again? All we need you to do is fill out the form. It's an electronic form. It's been emailed. Um, today, the, commi the commissioner sent out what I believe to be the fifth reminder uh, to parents to please um, click the link. Um, it takes you, a li li takes you maybe two minutes to fill out the form and your child will be part of your child or children because you have to do one for each one of your children. Um, they will be part of the um, screening program that we use within our school. And so with the screening program, children are tested every two weeks and those, those results are only, are only revealed to the parents. The schools do not get the results. No one gets the result except the parent. Except the parents. So when they do their um, when they do their consent form, they put in the email address, they want to receive the results at, and only they will get the results. And so if a child shows up negative or positive, only the parent gets that result. Obviously, if there is a positive result, then the Department of Health will contact the school and say that there has been a positive test, and they will go through their protocols on um, uh, reviewing the schools and, and, and reviewing what uh, all of the COVID protocols that they have been doing to ensure that they have been doing the things that they were supposed to do, and then they'll make decisions on what happens with the particular class or anything that has to go wider than that um, at the particular school. So again, it's the Department of Health that makes this decision, not the Department of Education. We get informed just like everyone else. There's a positive at your school. We'll go in, we'll do what we need to do to see what is going on and what further steps need to be taken, and we simply just follow those rules. But outside of that, Duane, um, the mask wearing, um, the um, checks when you arrive at school, um, do not send your children to school if, they're, if they feel ill, if they look ill, if they're sneezing, coughing, got a runny nose, do not send them to school. Um, the, and pretty much how we ended the term with school COVID regulations will be how we begin this term um, in, the, in, in a couple of days in September. Okay, thank you for that. And just a follow-up question. What, what exactly would happen if, because right now you have less than 50% of the parents that have consented to the children being tested. Um, hopefully that does go up. But what what is the protocol if if that does not occur with well, the testing? Dwayne, Dwayne um, the saliva screening is an enhanced protocol to everything that we're already doing. This is just some this is just another way of uh, catching something that may not even show itself uh, for a time. And so the reason why we, we, we are really pushing parents to consent to, to sign the consent forms is when a child is deemed positive and that child has to um, say the Department of Health says that child has to quarantine, that now means the household is quarantined. And, and then if, if that child wasn't caught soon enough and, the, and they go into the school and find out that, yes, this child has been exposed to this person, to that person, to this person, to that person, then we're talking about more people being quarantined and more households being quarantined. And you can understand the knock-on effect of that. Um, you know, but if we're in a position where we catch something earlier, catch something early, there could be other mitigating pro processes put in place uh, other than um, wholesale quarantine and such. But if we don't catch, if something is not caught and it's allowed to become symptomatic as such, then it becomes a bigger issue to deal with. So you, I, I, I'm hoping the listening public and I'm hoping you guys understand how important it is for us to have something in place that just regularly tests, and it's a non-invasive test. Actually, the children enjoy it more than adults do. They have a tube and they just, and, and you know, and I'm going to be real here, they spit in it, and that's it. <laughs> there, there is no, there's no Q-tip up the nose, there's no... Um, you know, uh, retrieving of anything else. They deposit the saliva in the tube. The tube is then sealed sealed in their own bag that has their name and everything on it. It's sent off to the lab. It's tested. And in the most part, as we saw in our pilot last last year, the majority of people came back positive. Well, I mean, majority of people came back negative. I'm sorry about that. We did, however, catch a few students who were positive that would have never known, and no one would have known because they didn't show any signs, they didn't show anything, and we were able to 
you know, extract them from the classroom and save class classes, whole classes from being put on um, put on quarantine and that sort of thing, which again triggers a knock-on effect with the home life. And in some cases where parents are at those types of uh, positions where they cannot, um, they can they, they don't get paid if they don't show up to work and that sort of thing. You know, it's a real blow. It can be a real blow to our parents and to our economy if uh, through um, one person, one, one student that could have been found out early is not found out, and then it it actually it has this knock-on effect of you know multiple households. In, in in some cases, a single a single exposure within our school can have an effect on up to a hundred, literally to a hundred people. And so that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to get to a point where people are comfortable with us saying that we're doing this um, screening, testing, uh, catching our students early. Um, um, if they have been exposed, and, and that also gives us an opportunity to figure out where they were exposed to. Perhaps there's some, an issue somewhere else that needs to be looked at. But the idea is to keep our schools open, keep our islands safe by having non-evasive testing, by depositing saliva in a tube and allowing us to be tested. So outside of all of the other protocols, that is the, the biggest addition to anything else that we're doing, and we really call upon our, our parents to um, read the email that was sent out by the commissioner. If you do not get the email, please contact the Department of Education to figure out why you're not on the email list. Um, you can also go to the moed.bm website, the ministry website. As soon as you log on, a, a box will pop up and say, if you're here for, to sign up for the um, saliva consent, click this button and it will take you to the um, consent form. Um, we're doing everything possible to um, inform our parents of, of this um, uh, to avail themselves of this uh, of the screening program. We're using social media, we're using the media, we're using radio appearances like this. We're doing everything that we can to uh, get our parents on board. Now that's amazing. Um, moving into the educators, uh, how do you feel that the teachers have come around to the uh, new COVID protocols? Or do you feel there's any uh, pushback or any disagreements between the protocols coming into play with teaching and whether or not that's caused any friction? Well, um, we, we've now, we're now entering into literally our third school year. Um, you remember this started at the end of the, um, the school year, the 2019, um, the 2020 school year, then it went through the 2020-21 school year, and now we're entering to the, the 21-23. So I think um, our teachers, first of all, I just want to say welcome back, teachers. They're back in officially for public school. They're back in officially next week, um, Wednesday, I believe it is. September, next week, Wednesday, yes, September 1st, uh, they'll be back in. And our, our the dedication that our teachers show towards our students is, is always something that I marveled at. And, and, you know, it's just a phenomenal um, thing. Uh, some of our teachers act as, you know, they're not just teachers. They're, they're moms, they're dads, you know, they're confidants. Um, you know, they're, they're their shoulders to lean on. There are a whole lot of other things than just teachers within our system. And so they, I believe that our teachers um, recognize where we are uh, with this, and they do everything in the, within their power to ensure that our schools are safe as well. So, you know, they, they may um, see, see a, a child with a, a mask lacking and go and, with, you know, let the child know, you know, pull the mask up. But they're also empathetic, and they understand the, the uncomfortableness of wearing masks and such. So, um, things like um, breathing breaks are, are worked into are worked into the system, uh, and, and things like that to help our children, um, you know, feel more comfortable and, and understand what it is that they're doing. Um, we last year we did um, initiate when I say last year, last school year we did um, when vaccinations first came about. Um, teachers were put into that that critical group. You remember when they? Uh, I'm sure um, we remember when they first came about. There were certain people that could get it first and then second and third, and so the teachers were bumped right up. Uh, we petitioned, and they were bumped right up, so they were given that access. Um, we, I, you know, uh, as vaccination is a personal choice, I can't speak to the percentage of teachers who are vaccinated because I simply don't know who is and who isn't because they're not, um, they're not expected to report that. Um, but, you know, I do hope that if, um, you know, everyone – who is considering vaccination talks it over with their trusted physician and a physician and makes a makes a um, you know informed choice on that uh, because um, you know I I will admit that I am vaccinated and um, it's something that I've talked to with with my with my daughter 
she was 11 years old, uh, and her mom, and um, you know, so so my daughter actually understands, and she she acts as informed decisions about it, and I encourage parents to talk to their children and have informed decisions about um, vaccinations, mask wearing, and that sort of thing. So they so that once the children understand and recognize that their parents are supportive, and right and, and understand as well, it, everything goes smoother that way. But getting back to the to the teachers, we understand it, it's different from what we're doing, well, what, you know, from traditional teaching, you're not allowed, you're not, you can't go and do the things that you used to do, you know, go hug up children and, and they all come and, you know, and gather around you and stuff like that. But our teachers have so, so shouldered on and have um, done the things that they're supposed to do. And, you know, you know, our, our, our system is proud of what our teachers do. And um, I have the utmost respect for, you know, them really, really facing this COVID scrum issue face on and um, doing what it is that needs to be done to ensure that our children get the best of what it is that they're there to, to get the best of, and that is an education. Thank you for that answer. Um, just to do a slight pivot, um, because I, since we have you here, I'd like to just ask you, um, yeah. we saw an article in the Royal Gazette, right, mm -hmm. about this uh, pilot program at work preschool. And I really wanted to, you know, give you the mic to speak on that because obviously with the, you know, Royal Gazette article, you can't get, you know, the full details of the, I know you rolled out that pilot program before, but just in case anybody else didn't know, and maybe just to touch on a bit about um, the disappointment of certain parents and how that happened and, you know, just the overall protocols, because it is a limited program, I understand. But just for the listening audience, you know, to get that information as well. Well, th th thank you. And um, although we came to talk about COVID, I, I don't mind speaking about that. Um, first of all, um, just to give a bit of history on two topics, on two topics. One topic is the um, Child Care Allowance Program. Um, the Child Care Allowance Program was the program that was introduced by the Progressive Labor Party, and it provides a payment to parents um, that fall within a certain income. Because there is a misnomer, because I read the article, and it said financial assistance um, parents, and that's actually not true. It is what we call um, child care allowance parents. And child care allowance is a fee that is that is afforded to parents whose income reach is under a certain threshold. Um, so, but that's not controlled by by this by the education. That's controlled by financial assistance. And so, the policy has always been in place from when um, child care child care assistance was introduced. Is that when the serve when school services for um, when school services are available that the government that the government um, puts on child care allowance recipients automatically have to enroll in that program and so the child care allowance can stop being paid. Child care allowance um, costs the government around eight hundred dollars a month uh, for parents who do qualify. And again. You can be, you can have child care allowance and not be a financial aid recipient because child care allowance is something completely different from financial aid, um, financial assistance. It, it is given to parents who apply for it whose income is below a certain threshold. Um, it does, and I, I read in the article they're talking about the, I own my own home and so I can't apply for financial assistance. The child care allowance doesn't take all of that into into um, into account. It takes into account what your actual income is. And then says yes, you qualify, and, and it's given, and it's a, an amount that's given, and it's paid directly to the private nursery that you are enrolled in. The government policy has always been on in September of the year that the child turns four, that is or that child care allowance is automatically cut off because those children now qualify for preschool, government preschool. There has never been an issue because there's always been enough spaces in preschool, <laughs> so no one got turned away, if you understand what I mean, Duane, right? Yes. No one got turned away. The This year with the Bright Key program, which has been a pilot program for three years to test if it was even if it was even a viable program, what happened this year, it turned out that we had in four schools, in four schools, there were not enough persons uh, at, of the age four that applied for preschool, so that created spaces to have but to, to have the, the um, Bright Care program in these four schools. And so there were eight spaces in each of these schools, which is 32 spaces. And so following with the government protocol, 
that is always the government the government policy that's always been in place. Of course, if we if the government is paying for someone to be housed in a private um, nursery, we're going to look at how they can be housed in public in public schools. And so, unfortunately, because we only had 32 spaces, those spaces filled up very quickly. Um, and and um, 32 spaces, eight per per school, they filled up very quickly. And um, you know, where where I think where we really um, owe, owe the public an apology is that um, that wasn't explained in the very beginning, and it probably should have been. It probably should have been explained in the very beginning. But because it's a policy that's always been in place for preschools, it's not something anybody really thought about. Because, as I said, when it comes to the four-year-olds, there's always been enough spaces, and so there's never been that I didn't get in so, scenario. But when we only have 32 spaces, invariably there are persons that, that will, will apply and be disappointed. But I will say... Um, that I do, uh, I, for that, I apologize to those parents out there who, who really did, um, you know, put in the application as they would for regular preschool for four-year-olds. And, um, you know, it's something that probably should have been explained uh, more thoroughly up front, um, but it wasn't, and we've learned from that. And it's something that um, if we're able to conduct um, the Bright Star program again next year, it's something that will be explained up front. And so people know that. Um, as I said, this year spaces were created because we didn't have enough enough um, children in certain schools that um, at the four-year-old level they created spaces. Who knows? Next year, all the spaces could be full with filled with four-year-olds, and then then we'll have to make a decision on if we can um, sustain uh, the bright the bright start program on that level. But um, uh, again, I just want to take this opportunity to apologize to parents out there and and let them understand that there was no deliberate. Um, changing of policy all of a sudden. This is a policy that has always been in place. Um, it, it was just, it just never has been been necessary to explain it uh, because it's now we've never had the issue where we've had, you know, um, multiple people applying, more people applying for spots that we had space for. Well, thank you for that um, answer. And I know I, I kind of threw you a curveball there, so I appreciate you. No, no, but, but it's okay. But understand, well, do if and, and you know, we always get the, the, the part about government wasting money and, and such. And, and so when we looked at this, um, Dwayne, you're looking at, you know, to, to think of it, do, you can do the calculations, 300, um, if you're talking about 32 spaces of uh, students that, that we would typically be paying $800 a month for, you can see, you know, that's, like around uh, just under three hundred thousand dollars that could be spent on something else, and who knows? Some of those parents that were unsuccessful may even qualify for child care allowance. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. They may even possibly qualify if they went, because um, I don't think there are some people out there that understand that child care allowance is a separate thing from financial assistance. It's a separate, completely different application, and so um, you know, uh, ho and hopefully. Um, the, the, those parents that did not get in are able to um, find adequate um, adequate coverage for their children. But um, as I said, it was 32 spaces, and that's really a, a drop in the bucket um, when you think about um, you know the 100 and close to 150 spaces we normally have for the P4, the prime, the four-year-olds. You know, and only that, so if we got 150 spaces and those get close to full, you know, there's about 150 three-year-olds out there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. looking for spaces as well and we only had 32 to fill yes no i totally get it and um well just to segue back to uh COVID, uh we have mr patrick singleton who's jumped into my co-host's vacant chair and oh, wow. <laughs> he was big shoes to fill um <laughs> uh, I, mean, I know patrick from from a from a former life so how are you doing patrick hello minister <laughs> I would like to ask your permission if you would uh, field some uh, COVID-related questions from him. Okay, I can't promise that I'll have the answers, but um, I can always endeavor to get back. <laughs> so you can go ahead. My apologies. I, I was on the phone when you started, so I didn't catch the beginning parts. So may, some of this may be answered, but I'm part of a scientific research and writing group, and we have we've been publishing papers on COVID over the past... Uh, more more than a year in places like the British Medical Journal and, and other journals. And uh, I literally got off the phone with them, doctors in Asia and in America, and we're looking at the Delta variant and how it's highly transmissible. We all we all know that. Yeah. Um, now, we've got schools going back next week. Bermuda College was due to go back, but they're 
they're going online. I think Burmese Institute's back. Um, and I, I caught a little bit of you of mentioning that if a, if a class goes down, then the parents are probably going to have to quarantine as well. And that means they may not be able to generate income. And that's a problem. And I just wondered whether you might consider talking to the, the Ministry of, Edu- of uh, Health excuse me, about uh, providing rapid tests to parents so that they can test their children at home um, in the days leading up to school, the start of school, and perhaps for a period of 10 days or two weeks when they get into school. Because if Delta gets into one of these schools and you're doing, you know, weekly or monthly saliva testing, you might catch the, you know, you might catch it, but it may have already burned into the school and caused the, the shutdown of the school. So I wondered whether um, these these rapid tests that you can do at home, and they're doing them in the UK, and they're, they've got them in other countries, and it's helping to catch the cases before they enter the school. I was wondering if that's something that you may have considered. Um, actually, um, I, I will admit that I'm a COVID novice when it comes to looking at what the latest and greatest technology is um, on that. But it's something that can be that something that I can carry to the Department of Health uh, mm-hmm. or the Ministry of Health and to ask um, for for their answer on that. Um, as I started, when, as I stated when we first came on is um, we default uh, the COVID protocols and everything that we do that that is aligned with um, COVID are directives that come from the Department of Health. And so there's nothing that the the, the, the Ministry of Education or the Department of Education actually make up (laughs) when, uh, you know, or or, or, what we do opine, because when they come and say, oh, we need, we would want, we want you to do this. Of course, our expertise is to say, well, this is how it's going to, this is the effect it's going to have on, on education. Is there any other way we could do it? Or yes, this is acceptable. We'll figure out a way to work around that. So in terms of the, the you call them rapid testing? Yes. In terms of rapid testing, that's something I would have to, um, I would have to make a okay. query at the Department of Health or the Ministry of Health and see if it's anything that could be considered for use in Bermuda. It, it isn't the gold standard PCR testing. It's not, uh, I mean, Karika Weldon, Dr. Karika Weldon has done such a fantastic job of keeping Bermuda safe, and this is not to the same level, but it would help to catch, if, you know, if you did one, two, three, four tests in the, in the days before uh, the child started school, and if, and if the test wasn't sensitive enough to catch them on day one, maybe it catches them on day two, day three, maybe even as they're going to school, you know, if they've got it, because we saw the case of the of the child whose parents, you know, recently arrived back. We don't know if they were vaccinated or not. The CMO said last night on our news that the child wasn't vaccinated, and the child went to a camp or a nursery. And boom, you know, the, the that that establishment all caught it. That the teachers there caught it. Or the camp counselors caught it. The parents caught it, and then you've got this knock on effect where it just spreads so rapidly. So I'm not. You know, I, I don't want to tell the Ministry of Health what to do because they are the experts in Bermuda. But to consider another uh, tool in the toolkit, it's not as good as the PCR test, but perhaps it might catch it before because you know, they can't test every child for do a PCR test every day for you know two weeks. But the rapid tests, they're cheap, they're disposable. You know, you, you can buy them in bulk, and it's something to consider to try to stop it because if this Delta variant gets in to our schools, it could you know we could see large case numbers like they have in, in Israel and in Iceland and other places where the kids have gone back to school. Um, now, the fortunate thing in Bermuda is that we do have uh, 65% of the population vaccinated, and we know mm-hmm. that this, uh, this virus is not uh, putting people in hospital or killing them that, that, are, that are vaccinated. So that's a good thing, but we got to keep it out of the kids as well if possible. So I, I just wanted to, to make that point. And um, just, just if I could quickly add to that, um and, and thank you for thank you for um, pointing that out for me, um, Patrick. Um, the case that you just spoke about it it is one of the unfortunate things is there are there are policies in place to prevent that from happening. But if our parents don't follow those policies, and um, th- those are the types of things. So when you just talked about that about someone um, recently arriving and sending their child, it's a policy. Your children's not supposed to be in school if you travel. <laughs> they're not they're not supposed to be in school until right. uh right. the day four or day eight or day ten on uh, negative tests and so and that that's something we're battling as well because um you know uh we 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 have to 
educate our people is that small ounce of prevention at the at the beginning could could be the difference between you know as I mentioned to uh, Duane earlier hundreds of people being sidelined versus you being inconvenienced for a few days and so we really have people to 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 have to buy into that and so that's why you know with with school the return to school um, we the in the Bermuda public school system we plan we have already instituted that um, even immunized persons returning to the island will not be allowed to be back into the school before their day four negative test. Mm. And so th those are the types of things that those are the types of things we're putting in place to try and catch it because we recognize that, um, you know, it's, it's um, although we although we practice bubbles within our school system, and um, for those of you that do not understand what the bubbles are, is one class stays with their classmates and they don't intermingle with other persons. And that's how we're able to if we do catch one of them, um, whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic within a classroom, we can very quickly isolate that bubble and then do the thing, uh, and the Department of Health can do the things to ascertain whether any additional mitigation needs to happen within the persons that were in that bubble or not. And so, you know, we, we, we know it's an inconvenience, and, but I also know that we're not going to live with this forever in the state that we are. There's going to be a time where we, as we say, looking beyond the pandemic and where things will, will, will I don't believe, I, and my personal belief is we'll never return to what we consider normal, you know, five, ten years ago. But we'll, re, we'll get to a state where we're able to operate within um, we, we, within this scale. Just, it's like the flu, you know, when the flu was around, it was really, really bad, and we've gotten to a point where we can operate with flu, you know, bump, popping up um, seasonally. But... Um, you know, there are things that, that, that people need to do, and, and all of us need to do our part to ensure that we um, remain, remain safe. And um, we're not affecting innocent bystanders by irresponsible behavior. Um, but thank you for that. I've written it down. I'll take it to um, um, next time we're sitting in our COVID um, cabinet meeting and, and, and raise that question. Thank you, Minister. The rapid test. Thank you for your time. I wish you and all the teachers and, and all the parents and the students, the, you know, a safe, a safe return to school, and I and I want to turn it back over to Mr. Robinson for for an excellent show. Thanks, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Patrick. Hey man, an excellent show. Th thank, thank you, Patrick. I'll, I'll take that, uh, <laughs> Minister. Thank you so much. Um, just, just for my curiosity here, because I, I, you've probably said it in some of your releases, but what is the, um, you know, protocol as far as testing? Uh, for teachers, uh, teachers adhering to the same testing regime, and and also, yes, the the, the teachers are part of the um, saliva screening um, um, program as well, and uh, and obviously they have to consent uh, to the program as well. Um, there there is no there is no legal remedy for us to force people to be tested, to force them to sign up. To test, so this is why we're on radio shows like this, and, and just trying to talk. Um, you know, if if there is a question that anyone has about um, the saliva testing, please ask. Um, I would rather you ask than to think and 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 think of something that is possibly not even correct. Um, you know, at the uh, as and you'll hear me say this over and over and over, and people are people will get tired of me saying it, but I'll continue to say it is one, the best place for our students is in the classroom. Um, although, although our remote learning has been greatly enhanced as we move forward, but um, as, you know, as, as this has come about and as we move forward, um, we, we've done some things during the summer to, to, um, to get our remote learning even at a better place than it has been. Um, as you know, we've had the um, uh, Chromebook donations and we've been working um, and the IT team has been working extremely hard. I believe we have uh, around 1,500 of them uh, donated. And so when those are um, issued um, during this next term to our, our P, our, and we're starting at the primary level, we'll, we'll have covered almost all of the primary school children that should have them with, with, this, with this batch. Um, but the best place for our children is in the school, in the classroom, accepting instruction. Everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we implore others to do and pay attention to is to keep our children there. When our children are in school, their parents can go off to work. When our parents go off to work, that 
keeps our economy ticking over and things start to eventually get better. But if we are forced to close schools and people are forced to be at home, that has a detrimental knock-on knock effect of our economy, of, of our children's learning, of our, and of our island as a whole. Our children need to learn. Our parents need to work. It, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a balancing act that, that we're doing here um, because we do not want to jeopardize anyone's health um, over employment or over being in school. So that's why we want to put everything that's humanly possible in place to try and keep our schools safe as, as, as we can so we can continue to move forward as a country. And that's what we want for sure. And I just got a, a question from a listener. Yeah. Um, just about is there going to be a shortage of uh, teachers or principals at the start of the school year, and will there be enough substitutes? Um, that is a good question. Um, as far as as far as I know from the commissioner, we um, we have more, we have our complement of um, teachers. Um, our principals, obviously, um, our principals had to report to schools today. I haven't heard of any principals not not reporting. Um, teachers report next week. As a matter of fact, today I, I greeted 13 brand new teachers to the to the school system who will be starting in, in September. Um, we've also, um, the commission has also presented us with a plan for substitutes. And this was something that was, um, that we did struggle with last, last year with, with substitutes, but there is an actual plan to recruit and have in the bank more substitutes than we normally would have because you never know when someone is, um, you know, will we'll perhaps have to isolate themselves, not because of something that happened within the school, but something that happened at a function they went to on the weekend. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or something, or their spouse, or their, their partner was exposed at something else. And because, um, you know, one, one of the things uh, I will say about our protocols from last year, the, until towards the end, until towards that, that little spike we had um, around Easter, there was no confirmed exposures within school. Everything that happened within the school happened outside of the school, and then a, 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 parent, a, a teacher showed up or a, a um, student showed up, but health contact to say, well, that student has been, we've confirmed that student has been exposed to something that happened outside of school, and so now we have to do something within the school, or that teacher has been exposed to something that happened without a school, and we now have to do something within the school. And so uh, we, I, I can say with confidence that, you know, what we were doing last year was working because um, the tra there, there was um, almost no transmission within school until until we got to um, that real outbreak in Easter, and we then we you know we put things on on hold and arrested that and did some remote learning, and then went back and reopened schools, and we ended up finishing the year pretty good. Yes, definitely. Um, as we look overseas, it's it's uh, been seen that a lot of people have seen that Delta has kind of taking hold of uh, of schools relatively quickly in our mm -hmm. in our larger neighbors and you know a lot of people are pretty much saying that they feel like you know it's it's kind of only a matter of time here so mm -hmm. you know obviously we've got protocols but just to give somebody who was looking at those headlines overseas and saying oh goodness what is Bermuda doing that's different like how is my child you know uh, is more protected than what we're seeing in the larger countries. And I know we've talked about um, the protocols, but I just, you know, an overarching thing from you, Minister, as, as a bit of a reassurance to the parents as to, like, how Bermuda will differentiate itself and, you know, ensure that children are not subject to a large uh, Delta variant outbreak. Well, you know, here's the, um, here's the interesting thing about that. Um, when we reopened schools in September, we did something that that some of these countries that you're talking about now couldn't accomplish and didn't accomplish. And so we, I am confident that the things that we have in place and that we put in place helped us to keep our schools open as long as people followed the, followed the rules. And so if we continue to follow the rules, if we continue to be um, cautious, if we continue to do the, just those basic things, you know, um, sanitize, um, stay your distance. Don't put yourself in situations that will expose you. Expose you. Um, we'll be relatively safe. As I said, lad, as I said um, previously, it is our 
it, it was our children and teachers that were exposed outside of school and bring it in. So, you know, it's not just what we do in our schools, it's what we do outside of our schools as well. And as we've moved on and we talked about, and, you know, and we heard people talking about beyond the pandemic, people have become comfortable. You know, I was listening to the, um, the health minister the other day say, you know, you know, people need to understand that your work colleagues is not your bubble. Your family is your bubble. So just because you're at work and you're familiar with these people, that doesn't mean you should let your guard down and not wear your mask when you're supposed to, not sanitize your hands, you know, not do, not do those things. Because as, as Bermuda has done so well with, 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 with this COVID crisis, people start to become lax. And it's like, okay, well, cool. You know, but um, Bermuda's plan is not to eliminate the, the the virus because to eliminate the virus would mean close our borders and no one can come in. And anybody who is sick here, when they get well, they, there is no possible exposure because our borders are closed. You know, like they're doing in New Zealand and, and Australia. But that's not our. That's not that doesn't work for us. We have to have our borders open. And at, and at this case. The only place for, well, once we got to the place we were at, the only place for the virus to be introduced into Bermuda is through the border. So you have strong border control. But if you have persons, when you have strong border controls and people are flaunting those, that's where you start to have impacts on the people who are already on island. And so it's just a matter, for me, um, Duane, it's just a matter of following the rules. Um, Follow the rules in school like we have done but follow the rules outside of school as well. So we don't get exposures outside of school that we can bring into school. And so for those parents, I just want to reassure them that we will follow our rules within our schools and we just need them to do their part as well and follow the rules outside of school so they, so we don't introduce anything into the school that shouldn't be there. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask you to pull out your crystal ball now <laughs> and uh, see if you can um, tell me a bit of the future, uh, at least from your estimation. So we, we have uh, a few school closures. Uh, do you feel as though, you know, uh, influx of, of new students into uh, the pre-existing schools, do you see any sort of um, increase in volume of classes? Do you see any increase of bubbles? Do you feel like that influx of students will cause any issues with uh, the COVID bubble regime that you are currently employing? For, for, let's, let's rewind that. You said school closures. What school closures are you referring to? Because there are, there are no schools being discontinued in this academic year or in the next academic year. No, that's why I said your crystal ball, because what I'm uh, talking... Oh, you think let me move when we move forward. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about okay. your crystal ball, not, not right now. Remember, remember, remember um, this. The, the plan for at the primary school level is no class with more than 15 children per class, period. No matter what school, or no matter how many schools we have, no matter how many school building, how many schools that we redevelop into the school of the future to match the curriculum that we're currently put, putting together now and the training that we're giving to teachers for that curriculum. But the idea is that the maximum amount of students in a classroom would be 15. And so, and that is actually less than what we have now within our classrooms. Right now, um, our, our maximum um, classes due to COVID go up to 18. And so I think, I think um, looking at my crystal ball, I think we'll be even in a better position to have bubbles work in those um, future primary schools that we're talking about because classes will be limited to 15 per class. Oh, perfect. I mean, the only reason I ask is because I think we all know that, you know, COVID isn't, as much as we hope, it isn't quite good anywhere, maybe for a few more years. You know, as, as I said, as I said to another um, uh, radio host that I was talking to, is uh, COVID is like that 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 annoying guest that you didn't invite that came with somebody, you, you came with a friend, but won't leave. The friend's gone, but the annoying guest is still there, annoying you. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, but I, I think that that definitely reassure a lot of parents. Mm-hmm. You know that you know the school size will actually decrease. Yeah, uh, going yeah. forward. But well, that's not something we haven't said. Uh, it's all been all part of our, um, you know, when we talk about the parish um, proposals, and we've been talking about them since de- since December of last year. We've been talking about um, the potential proposals, and obviously, you know, I made the announcement the week before cup match of um, which direction we were going in. Um, some people are ecstatic. Some people are ho hum. Some people are absolutely furious. But 
at the end of the day, Dwayne, everything we do, everything we say has to has to encourage our us as adults to put our egos and our sensitivities to the side and say, is this what's best for not just the children that are going to school in 2021, but for future generations? And um, I think I, I I know for a fact that this is this is a better scheme for them, and we have to all pull together and row in the same direction, um, you know, to ensure that our children get the best that we can offer them. Um, I've said this before, and you'll hear me say it time and time again. Education is not about elections. Education is about future generations and making sure that we have the things in place for future generations. And I will stand by that no matter what anybody comes and says about um, uh, education reform and what we're doing for our children. It is about our children. It will always be about our children. And um, I, I, do, I do apologize that I may upset people, and we may upset people as we move forward, but at the end of the day, we have generations to look out for, not just not, not what's going on today with, with our adults. We have little ones that are, that are coming that will be in this world soon that need to know that when they go to school, they will get an equitable system that will provide them with the tools to be successful no matter what skills they bring to the game. And that's the dream. <laughs> that's the dream. And um, I think I think anyone listening would agree. Obviously, you know, everyone's going to have an opinion. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. I mean, you and know, there's yeah. Not, there, there's nothing wrong with opinions. Everyone can have an opinion. And we can talk. And we can dialogue. And we can do all that we need to do. But, you know, when you come step to me with, with your rationales and your arguments, the first thing I'm going to ask is, how will that enhance learning for our children? And that's where and that's where your basis of all of your arguments should stand. It, it should be able to stand firm on that foundation and build from there. Definitely, especially when it comes to any conversation about educating our youth. Um, so we we have we have a, a bit of a uh, I would say an island wide issue. And I don't want you to weigh in too much on the details. Okay. Okay. I understand. I understand that you're probably not going to be able to go into the weeds on it, but a lot of people are obviously concerned that we do have an up and coming um, possible uh, general strike. Now, with that, I just on the education side, not <laughs> not on anything else, but on the education side, along with um, the new Delta variant coming in. And, you know, this general strike is supposedly supposed to be directly or near to the start of the uh, new school year. Uh, do you have any concerns as the education minister regarding, like, how that might affect uh, this up and coming school year, especially with everything that is already kind of having to go into ensuring the safety of our students? Do you feel any sort of concerns regarding that? Well, first of all, Dwayne, it, it, there, I'll, I'll always be concerned when there is a um, when there is a seemingly unsolvable issue between the Progressive Labor Party and and the unions. I, I'm always concerned about that. Um, however, um, you know, it's already had an effect on education, where the Bermuda College will, um, because of the intended work stoppage um, next week, Monday and Tuesday, that um, they've decided to start, because the, the Bermuda College starts on Monday, they've, just started, they've decided their first week will be remote um, because we just can't predict, we just don't know well, what, what will, will actually happen. Um, I am hopeful that whatever, whatever um, disagreements can, there, there is a common ground that can be made. Uh, obviously, you know, from, from where I stand, I know what the disagreement is, and you know, it, it is a demand that a piece of legislation be changed. Um, the government's um, stance is very firm that that legislation is sound and does not need to be changed. And, you know, you, you kind of sit back and say, well, where do you go from here? Yes. <laughs> if, 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 if everyone's saying do this and the other group is saying no, <laughs> you know, where, where do you go from there? But I am hoping that um, by the time September 9th comes around and our students are back in school, that um, um, we, we have um, gone back to a level of normalcy uh, amongst, our, amongst our union partners. And, um, you know, everyone is doing what they need to do to ensure that our children are getting that education that they deserve, uh, whether it be, um, 
you know, transportation to schools, whether it be um, um, the educators that are inside of the schools, um, even down to our custodians that um, are BIU members that need to, you know, that that, we, that are required to be there with the enhanced COVID protocols and, and, and cleaning and polishing and, and walking through the school on a, on a you know, and I, I, you know, some before they used to walk through the school on an hourly basis. Now it's like literally on a minute basis, wiping down door handles, wiping down high touch spots, um, ensuring that the um, the hand sanitizers are full, um, ensuring that the, the school has the necessary supplies to ensure that they're protocol safe, making sure the soap dishes are full, making sure there's adequate paper there. You know, this is stuff that they're doing more of than they've ever had to do. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to us going back to school. I'm looking forward to everyone being there happy, um, you know, happy that the school year has begun on a positive note where and our children are back in and doing what they're supposed to do. So I am... Um, I'm hopeful that any of this um, industrial action will not um, overshadow school openings. I, I'm hopeful that whatever needs to be worked out could be worked out um, so we do come to an agreement as we move forward. And I'm very hopeful that the relationship between the Progressive Labor Party and the Bermuda, um, uh, Bermuda Union, the um, BIU, is, um, is something that can be talked about, worked on, and, and move forward from the current impasse that we have. Yeah, I think I think uh, all of us agree regarding that. It's just um, with the uh, new protocols that we have coming in and, you know, everyone's just thinking it's just one more thing, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, well, I, and, and as a parent with a child in the public school, I, I'm, you know, I, when I take off the political hat and I sit down and I talk to my daughter as a dad, as I visit the school as a father, you know, I have the same concerns. As every other parent out there, um, trust me, I know how to separate being the minister and, and, and being being a father of a child that's in the public school system. I, I know what they're going through. I know I have the same conversations you probably have with your children as well. And um, a work stoppage is not something that is in the best interest of our country as a whole right now. And um, I do certainly hope that um, Monday comes around and we don't experience that. And I certainly do hold out the hope that by the time September 9th comes around, none of this is even, you know, this is just a distant memory uh, for us as we move forward with opening school. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, we, we can agree on that. Um, well, now that we're coming to the bottom of the hour. Oh, what, what, what going that far already? This is the top of the hour. Oh, 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 yep. I actually got, you know, I got corrected by that with Miss Ding, you know, and she told me, and I, here she is, she's probably going to wrap my knuckles that I ran and made the same mistake in front of the education minister. Yes, we're at the top no, no, of y'all. We are, we are all fallible. So that's one thing you won't get from me. I do not, um, you know, I make mistakes all the time, so I do not hold anybody to some higher level. For sure. <laughs> Definitely. Well, uh, we're at the top of the hour, so um, I just want to turn it over to you if there's any other um, COVID-related things regarding this um, new uh, school year start that you'd like to impart on parents and a listening audience. Um, please do so. Well, Dwayne, um, the only thing that I would I really um, push is parents sign the consent form. Uh, we're, make, we're making it as easy as you can. If you do not have access to a cell phone, to a, to a device, to the Internet, contact the Department of Education, and we will help you do what needs to be done. Um, there's free computer access, in our, I believe, in our post office, but definitely in the um, National Library, which falls on the, the Ministry of Education. You need to get to one of them to do it. Um, do your thing. If um, you know, call me up. I'll come and bring my cell phone and bring my device, and we can sit down and do it together if that's what we need. But we just want to we just want to have our our children kept safe. We want our schools kept safe. And one 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 of our um, well, one of the things that we can use is the saliva screening process that can help um, keep our schools safe. And but we need parents to sign up for the consent. Go to the website www.moe.bm. If you haven't seen the email from the commissioner, go to the website. The first box that pops up is how to sign up for um, how to sign up, sign up your child um, with the consent form. Fill that out electronically, and away we go. And that's the biggest thing that I want to push, Dwayne. And if you signed up last year, you have to sign up again this year. Please, please, please. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, parents, I hope you've heard that. Um, obviously, if you have any concerns about anything, please talk to your doctor or refer to the uh, Ministry of Health's releases. And obviously, I'm sure that uh, folks at the Department of Education will help you to the best of their ability as well. Yes. So with that, Minister, I'd like to thank you for coming on. Um, if you have anything um, that you'd like to follow up with us on, I know you can contact myself or Chris. Yeah, I'm on. And we can, you know, chat it up some more. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, I told you guys, anytime you ask me to come on the show, I, I will make myself available. I know. And then uh, Chris ran away. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> you know, but no, yeah, well, what, what you can do um, uh, is um, no, you know what? I'll speak to Chris and you guys separately offline on that. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, he has been like that since his team lost come at you. Know? Well, my team, too. Oh, I knew. That's why I said it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's always an extra. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Whatever you say. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for coming. On. I know you have a, a busy schedule, so we appreciate it. And you make sure to have a good day and you stay safe. Okay. Okay, cool. Have a good one. Thank you. All right. So, Don, I hope that we've managed to get some information out to parents and any of the listening audience. Um, and I think that that was a very informative. Very, very informative. Any questions, like he says, uh, go to the website and, and, and peruse and, and get, uh, get answers. That's right. Yeah. So, on that note, um, before... Uh, my co-host gets jealous that I'm here. I'm using up all the earth time about him. Yeah, but he said, "What he say? You got a message there?" <laughs> no. <laughs> Not yet, but I know it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> so we'll we'll adjourn until next week, September second. Okay. All right. And you have been listening to Motion to Adjourn with MP Chris Famous and Dwayne Robinson.